Hello there. My name is Dr. Samantha Brooks. Uh, I am currently a reader in cognitive neuroscience at uh, Liverpool John Moores University. And I'm here to give you a brief talk uh, about um, some of the data that I've collected over the last 15 years uh, to describe um, some of the neural processes of appetite control and how this data can support a working memory training intervention that we're starting to develop uh, here in Liverpool. Uh, that intervention is called Curb Your Addiction, as you can see there on the bottom of the screen. OK, so my talk outline, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the early work that we've done, uh, looking at subliminal emotional processing and the interaction that that has with working memory. That's helped us to develop this uh, intervention that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, some progress uh, in terms of appetite control at the Maudsley Hospital that I did uh, as part of my PhD. This was looking at people with eating disorders, and that's helped me and my colleagues uh, to understand uh, some of the brain processes that we might be able to apply uh, to substance use uh, disorder. Uh, and then in Sweden, we uh, continued to um, conduct uh, brain imaging studies, mainly fMRI, looking at the early risk factors of severe appetite control. So in the absence of starvation effects on the brain. And that again tell, told us something about um, working memory processes and how these contribute to um, uh, appetite control and, and uh, what brain regions are, are activated. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then uh, from Sweden to South Africa, uh, we applied this work or this uh, uh, collective set of data to uh, first develop a prototype for a working memory training intervention in people with uh, methamphetamine uh, use disorder in Cape Town. And then after that uh, series of studies, and we've published a couple of papers on that, um, I returned from South Africa to the UK. And as I said, uh, to develop, um, we're currently developing this uh, working memory training intervention uh, in Liverpool using virtual reality. So I'll tell you a little bit more about that uh, as, uh, as I go on. OK, so um, this is uh, my sort of timeline uh, of things that, that, that I've done to uh, develop this body of evidence to um, help us understand uh, the, the neural processes of appetite control that we can apply to uh, an intervention for uh, substance use disorder. Um, and uh, really, all of my work over these years, starting with my master's at the Institute of Psychiatry in London in 2002, has been uh, really um, hinged on this model of uh, a spectrum of appetite control. Of course, my background is in eating disorders uh, and more recently substance use disorder. But we developed, um, we developed, uh, or we we were able to uh, understand some of the brain processes from this collective work, and it hasn't really, over the years, from either my work or reading colleagues' work in the field, changed that much. So you know, severe appetite control, restricting of appetites that include eating and uh, stimulant use disorder, really seem to incorporate these these this network of, of processes. It, also something missing here is the parietal cortex um, as well, uh, but really uh, sort of prefrontal systems uh, for appetite control and then along the other side of the spectrum for impulsivity and uh, um, uh, you know, uh, lack of control of appetites, we've got binge eating and stimulant use. And this sort of seems to incorporate dorsal straight and amygdala sort of uh, limbic structures, basal ganglia hypothalamus and some of the genetic markers there as well. And we also were able to think about some of the comorbidities that um, were associated with uh, these extremes. Uh, so OCD, uh, perfectionism, attention to detail on the one hand uh, for restrictive behaviours and high arousal, promiscuity, alcoholism on the other and, and, and high arousal. And in both extremes, uh, people tend to experience high levels of anxiety. Um, <clears throat> so my, my early work, excuse me, my early work was uh, looking at the interaction between uh, non-conscious uh, emotional processing, so with disease salient stimuli, so high calorie foods or aversive images from the IAPS picture uh, repository, and how these impinge on working memory and other cognitive functions. So I'm going to just explain a little bit about these uh, papers that we uh, published in the early days. So the first paper that sort of got me thinking about this uh, field, uh, cognitive emotion interaction, uh, specifically in terms of appetite control, 
we uh, showed people with severe restricting anorexia. So people with anorexia were on the black bars here and healthy controls matched for age on, and gender, obviously on the, um, in the white bars. And on this left-hand graph, uh, we can see here um, the one back uh, easier uh, working memory task. And on this right-hand graph, it's errors uh, related to the two back uh, more difficult task. And what we did here, we showed <coughs> um, both subliminal and supraliminal uh, images of food, neutral and aversive. We didn't differentiate, we just showed a collection randomly assigned of uh, food, neutral and aversive images. And as you'd imagine, um, in the uh, easier task, people just make less errors, they're not really affected by them. And that's uh, particularly true for the subliminal images. So subliminal images don't really tend to uh, interfere with an easier task of a low cognitive load. In the, in the people with anorexia, supraliminal, that means, you know, um, at the periphery of consciousness, so they can still see them a bit like the Stroop task, for example. Um, this did uh, cause the anorexic patients to make slightly more errors. So they were more prone to distractibility. Um, and uh, this was obviously true in the uh, more difficult task. So people generally made more errors in the difficult task. Uh, and um, they, uh, oops, sorry, I've just gone back too far. Uh, so um, the anorexic patients, they did make uh, significantly more errors dur during the supraluminal task. So they're more distractible. They couldn't differentiate. They couldn't separate out responding to the images, the arousing images and doing the task. However, in the subliminal condition, they were much better than the health controls at applying their working memory to uh, avoid that distraction of those arousing images. So, you know, there's a lot of um, things we can say about that data, but uh, this was the first in 2008, the first uh, study that we did as a group to start looking at this uh, interaction between uh, emotion processing and how it impinges uh, subliminally, at least on uh, working memory uh, processes. Then we took this a bit further and um, we separated out the food neutral and aversive images to see if a specific type of subliminal, subliminal image uh, uh, interfered with, uh, with cognitive processes. And we were also interested to see if this interference was specific to working memory or was uh, just uh, a general uh, prefrontal disturbance or whether this also uh, was a disturbance in a go-no-go -no -go task. And the reason that we're interested in a go-no-go -no -go task versus a working memory task is because typically a working memory task is a lateralized prefrontal function. So dorsolateral prefrontal cortex uh, related along with obviously uh, the, the network of, of uh, regions. Uh, whereas uh, a go-no-go -no -go task is predominantly associated with medial prefrontal anterior cingular um, uh, function. So we wanted to separate out specific areas of the prefrontal cortex. And we uh, showed sublim subliminal images of food, aversive and neutral. Here are some of the food images and they were paired uh, quite closely with neutral images that represented, that looked like food, but they weren't food. So the visual uh, matching was very close and then we could tap into that emotional content of the food. I won't show the aversive images because they were quite disgusting uh, from the IAMS. Uh, apologies for the slight blurring of this uh, graph. Uh, so this is, um, I haven't shown the uh, data for the go no go task because there was no significant interference caused by the subliminal images of any category. So the go no go task didn't seem to be affected by uh, the, the subliminal presentation of these images. However, during the go-no-go -no -go task, and this is the data that I'm showing you here, um, these are uh, on, on the y-axis, we can see mean errors. Patients with anorexia, res severe restricting anorexia in the black bars and health controls are in the gray. So you can see a superior performance in the uh, anorexic patients um, uh, in contrast to the health controls who made significantly more errors. And that was true in the aversive condition and in the neutral condition. But during the subliminal presentation of food images, the uh, number of errors significantly rose in the anorexic patients. And they were, there was no significant difference in the uh, number of errors that health controls or anorexic patients made during the food condition. So this suggested to us that um, there was something, remember these are subliminal images, there's something about the working memory process that is engaged to um, normally uh, suppress 
those uh, appetitive responses that we're not conscious of at first. Uh, and so these people with anorexia couldn't do both. They couldn't uh, employ the working memory uh, network to suppress, dampen, if you like, those appetitive processes and also engage in the task. However, the other two images and the other task uh, had no interference effects. And that suggests that those uh, the other working, uh, the other go no go uh, process isn't engaged to suppress uh, non conscious uh, effects of, of uh, food or appetite. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, this is what's uh, what I've just said. And but what is more, in another study that we um, published a couple of years later, we found that increasing the working memory load prevented sub subliminal interference in a healthy population. And this is what other people show in like pain research using cold press, for example, in the go no go. Uh, sorry, the NBAC task. Uh, the more you uh, in, uh, increase the cognitive load, the less these sub subliminal emotional um, processes impinge on uh, cognition. So that got us thinking even more that if you can strengthen this uh, top down working memory process, maybe it can be employed to, um, uh, you know, uh, harness um, or to control distractibility in the environment. So we went a bit further. Uh, and looked at um, brain processes. Uh, so those were non-brain uh, uh, imaging studies. So we went a bit further during my PhD to look at what could be the brain processes involved in this appetite control. This was just a, an early uh, meta-analysis, not brain imaging study, but contributed to it by showing us that in a, a food stroop task, uh, people with eating disorders are significantly slower than healthy controls. This is a meta-analysis of food stroop studies. And um, this told us that something additional was happening in the processing of people with anorexia when they're trying to engage in a distractibility task or to avoid distractibility. So that sort of corroborated our, our, our previous findings. And then in this study, this was a voxel-based morphometry early study where we compared age-matched um, health controls to um, anorexic patients, restricting anorexic patients. And normally you find, uh, you know, you continue to find there's been a massive Enigma um, um, large multi-center brain imaging study that's corroborated this recently uh, to show that people with anorexia have, um, uh, uh, you know, reduced uh, brain volume due to starvation. However, in this very interesting study, um, we showed that there was one area uh, the uh, right DLPFC in this case, we're looking into the bore of the scanner at this point, um, the uh, the right DLPFC was actually um, that th there was a, a normal what you might call age related atrophy in this region in the healthy controls um, in the healthy control women who were aged eighteen to sort of forty five. So as time went on, this brain region in the DLPFC right DLPFC reduces. Uh, and in the anorexic patients, this wasn't the case uh, when we looked at correlation with age. And it was interesting to try and understand what was saving, you could say, that age-related normal atrophy in that right DLPFC. What, what this uh, pilot data seemed to suggest is that um, uh, the more uh, uh, people with anorexia use cognitions to restrain their uh, 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 appetites, uh, this uh, brain region seems to be larger uh, in a sense. So. <clears throat> it's not really larger, it's just that it's not um, being atrophied in the normal way that you see it, it, as an age-related effect. Uh, effect. Um, and so it seems to suggest that you more, the more you use this sort of um, rumination process that's related to working memory processes in the DLPFC, the more it keeps on online uh, this, um, this brain volume uh, um, in this area. Um, so, uh, and similarly, in an fMRI study at the beginning uh, of this work, we found that um, uh, people with anorexia have reduced activation in those sort of uh, impulsive uh, brain regions uh, related to sort of um, stratum, sort of, you know, uh, um, uh, dopaminergic reward regions. So it seems to be the case that in, compared, in comparison to bulimic patients, people with anorexia tend to have uh, reduced uh, reward responses, which uh, in this paper as, all, as well was related to uh, increased uh, prefrontal uh, um, activation. So it all corrob corroborated our earlier uh, uh, neuropsychological findings uh, in, um, in uh, these subliminal studies. So in Sweden, we went further still to pro progress this work and looked at um, people who were adolescents with an early uh, uh, risk for eating disorders, and um, but we could measure their brains in the absence of um, 
uh, starvation effects. <clears throat> what we found is that an early risk for, risk for uh, um, eating disorders was this rumination uh, network, which incorporated those uh, working memory processes. Uh, and these uh, brain regions were uh, correlating with, um, uh, with um, obsessive compulsive uh, measures on the OCIR and uh, uh, impulsivity uh, responses. So the, without going into too much detail about this paper, you can read it here. These are uh, functional uh, changes uh, during a working memory task in the, in the fMRI scanner were uh, corresponding to um, uh, OCD and it, uh, raise it high, higher OCD scores and higher uh, impulsivity scores uh, during this task. And on the opposite side of the spectrum, we also found that people with uh, obesity, so people, um, this was also in Sweden, um, people who uh, were prone to uh, at least five years of being obese had worse working memory scores, they were not as good, and um, they had uh, lower uh, brain volume in uh, the working memory uh, network. Okay, so coming to the end of my talk now, um, and so we took all this data over the, you know, over that sort of five to seven year period, and um, we tried to uh, develop a, a study, pilot study, to test whether we could um, sort of encourage people to do a five day a week uh, for a month intervention to stimulate the working memory network in their brains that was progressively di difficult. It was, a, it was an adaptive working memory task that we did with methamphetamine users who'd been abstinent for a week, um, but they were all impatient. So they'd been abstinent for a week and then we, um, scanned them at baseline, gave them four weeks of this COVID addiction intervention, which went up to NBAC uh, uh, 4, level 4, um, and then we scanned them again after those four weeks. We also had a, a, co a control condition that just had treatment as usual. Uh, so we measured both brain volume and neuropsychological tasks, um, and we're currently uh, analysing the fMRI data uh, as well. Um, and what we found here was very interesting, although, uh, so it was sign highly significant, you, but remember it's only over four weeks and we're looking at vol brain volume here. So the best way to see, the best uh, slice was this axial slice to see the difference. Uh, so here we have uh, people that just engaged in four weeks of treatment as usual, which was dialectical behavior therapy and exercise and psychoeducation in, in the um, clinic in Cape Town. And then those people that had the additional, so these are all men, the, the men that had additional uh, working memory training over four weeks for half an hour, progressively difficult up to level four, um, they had significantly larger bilateral basal ganglia volume. And um, uh, this corresponded to um, improvements. The uh, red bar here is the treatment as usual, the blue bar is the working memory trained. This corresponded to um, improvements in impulsivity, so reduced impulsivity and greater self-regulation scores. Um, and we also found in this paper that the less damage, so methamphetamine is well known to damage prefrontal uh, structures specifically, and at baseline, the less damage they had to their left uh, DLPFC, the better uh, they uh, performed, you know, the more change they had on their self-regulation uh, scores. Um, so that's, that fits nicely with, with, with our hypotheses. Um, there is a lot, um, just coming to the end of my talk now, there is a lot of uh, as we all know, uh, criticism about working memory training interventions, uh, most commonly that they don't uh, uh, lead to far transfer effects, which is like uh, to say that uh, you, you don't see uh, improvements in quality of life uh, following a working memory training intervention. Um, but we wrote this paper that was just published last year in Frontiers uh, in Psychiatry um, to say really that um, uh, um, that, that probably it's better to look at other measures to, me to measure whether working memory training is effective. So looking at brain changes is one thing to do after a course of, work, uh, after a course of training, because uh, these often occur, brain changes often occur prior to behavioral changes. And also we, we argue in this paper that maybe uh, measures of um, uh, intelligence and attention are perhaps not the best measures because they're quite diffuse constructs. It's very difficult to pinpoint what somebody means by global intelligence. So um, here we argue that perhaps impulse control is a, is a much easier measure uh, to determine whether working memory training is effective. And what we found in this uh, quite extensive review of, of previous working memory um, 
brain imaging studies is that repeated working memory tra training does reduce brain activation in front of parietal and straital networks, and that reflects uh, better neural circuitry efficacy. Uh, and this can also be augmented uh, with uh, transcranial direct current stimulation, and it may be related to um, uh, dopamine catabolism in the prefrontal cortex. Um, and it's a very effective, it could be a very effective non-invasive intervention for working memory deficits. Um, <clears throat> so just a quick uh, uh, summary uh, uh, before I end here uh, of um, the subliminal uh, um, data that we found. So we found that, you know, stimulation occurs and it really activates anterior insular cortex, um, which, which also relates to parietal cortex somatosensory uh, processing and um, uh, interacts with, uh, at first, uh, the sort of gateway to the prefrontal cortex anterior cingular, and the fusiform gyrus is activated even in the absence of awareness. So this is the basic beginnings of the network of, of uh, disturbance, if you like, uh, caused by non-conscious appetitive stimuli, which then gets dealt with, uh, in essence, by this prefrontal uh, DLPFC uh, um, parietal um, uh, and striatal uh, circuitry. Um, so my final couple of slides then, I think I have gone slightly over, so I do apologise, but my final couple of slides is what we're doing now. So in Liverpool, uh, we've got all of this data, you know, uh, in our minds, and we're trying to uh, uh, develop further the intervention that we created in Cape Town uh, using virtual reality. And back in 2013, in fact, in the Daily Mail, uh, no less, um, uh, it was already being talked about uh, how virtual reality um, uh, sort of scenarios could be used to help uh, people with addiction learn to stay free of drug, uh, drink and drugs. Um, but we're trying to incorporate this. I mean, this um, example here at the bottom is for the eating disorder intervention that we're creating at the moment, uh, but we'll also have a scenario that's related to drug addiction. Uh, and what we do here is we're showing um, uh, the, the MBAP task uh, where these letters, this is just um, a shell at the moment because we're um, developing it, but we're uh, showing letters that appear on the screen and participants have to respond to these letters in the same way that you would do in a standard MBAC task, uh, going up to uh, quite a high level. And um, of course, they've got to try and avoid, uh, I mean, this, th there's other scenarios that have got more um, uh, engaging uh, food images in the background of a typical supermarket. Uh, but we're trying to encourage people to respond to the letters and avoid the, the typical sort of supermarket, which is very ecologically valid, using this Oculus Quest 2 device, which we've, we've now uh, acquired five of these Oculus 2 devices. And we're currently in the process of setting up a clinic, a neuropsychology clinic in the university here to um, collect data and also test um, how, how high up the uh, uh, MBAC task people can go during this training. So it's very exciting. Uh, and we're trying to basically with this work, as probably a lot of you know already, um, develop uh, or strengthen the, the window of tolerance. So there's a lot of you know, negative emotion, not just in people that are experiencing substance use disorder, but generally in the world at the moment. Uh, and if you can develop this or, or strengthen this window of tolerance with working memory, uh, you can prevent people from engaging in sort of uh, hyper arousal or, 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 or otherwise. Um, so that leaves me to say, and apologies for going slightly over, but a huge thank you to the people involved in the study. I would like to quickly name them because they've been really integral to my uh, thinking. Um, my supervisor, Dame uh, Janet Treasure, who's an eating disorders expert in London. Um, <clears throat> Helgi Schott, who's my boss in Sweden, who uh, leads the Functional Pharmacology Lab. Uh, this is my boss, uh, Professor Dan Stein in Cape Town, the head of the Department of Psychiatry. Um, uh, Mark Soames, Professor Mark Soames is a, an expert in sort of unconscious processes and uh, his uh, writings and, and books and things have led to, to a lot of my, uh, have helped me to develop my own thinking. Um, my current boss in, um, in Liverpool, my line manager, um, uh, Professor Helen Poole, and uh, my uh, collaborator in uh, South Africa at Wits University, um, uh, Kate Cockcroft, Professor Kate Cockcroft, and two of my research assistants, um, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Jamie Tully, who's now at Exeter University, and soon to be Dr. Rhiannon Mackenzie Phelan, who have also helped me uh, write uh, a few of the papers. Um, so yes, please do uh, email me your questions. I'd love to hear more about your ideas. Uh, my cats also says hello, and uh, I do hope that you will um, 
contribute to this really exciting field uh, to progress um, interventions for work and memory training. So thank you for listening. I again do apologise for going slightly over. Uh, take care. Bye for now.